All right. I've changed my methodology too. If you guys remember from years back, we used to do the bilingual slides. Because we're covering so much, I quit doing that because I wanted you to bring a Bible and read it, <laughs> you know, as we go to check what I say. But I, I'm going to do it probably for the rest of this um, book so that we can, again, cover ground a, a little bit faster. All right. And also, Catherine's not here today. I think she's sick. We should have prayed for Catherine as well. Uh, so usually we have French translation. Um, so here we go. Ecclesiastes 1.11. We saw last week uh, that he started off with, um, in fact, I think I included it. No, I didn't. Um, vanities of vanities. Okay. Um, that the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. And remember that word is havel. It's, a, it's an aspirith. It's to breathe twice, really. And, and really it's an onomatopoeia, a word that sounds like what it means. It is just a breath. That everything he's going to discuss here, and remember this is Solomon writing, or, uh, or someone taking the perception of Solomon, who has had access to everything. He was the king after David, David's son. He inherited wealth. He asked for wisdom, if you remember the story. He was a wise man of his day. And yet he is saying, Chavel, it's a breath. It's a breath. So the preacher, I the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. And I applied my heart to seek and to search. And so we see that he's looking for meaning. He's looking for meaning under the sun. And this is, I said last week, if you miss this piece of the book, under the sun, under heaven, uh, on the earth, these are all terms throughout the book that are telling you he's giving you a perspective of just within the realm of humanity. And, and that's what's going to make it dismal, is that in humanity, in and of ourselves, there's a stop. There's a tombstone waiting. There's a grave that is expected, okay? Even more sure than the tax man is death. Death will find us all. And so this is all under the sun. He uses this words, these words seek and search, and, and together in the Hebrew it means that he is being very diligent. He, he is trying to investigate and discover in a way that would bring forth um, you know, the truth of truth. Um, and here, here it is where he is. I thought I had it. And like I said, I'm a little out of sorts. But there's the review from last week. Vanity of vanities. All right, so it's all under the sun. And he's looking for wisdom. He's seeking. He's searching. It is an unhappy business. Actually, it's a bad translation. It should be bad. Uh, it actually is a word in Hebrew that means a moral failure. It's something that is not just uh, bad business, unhappy business, but it's evil. It's evil. Um, and you'll see that he uses this term, it is an evil business, what God has given to the children of man. And actually in the Hebrew, what that says is the sons of Adam. And though it may not bring kind of the same nuancing in our English, and that's why it's been translated the children of man, which is, is, a, is a valid translation for the sons of Adam. But the sons of Adam brings in a sense of the curse. It takes you back to the time of Genesis, and, and it, it allows you to remember that this is under the sun. This is the time of the fall. So everything's broken. Uh, I forget who said it. I quoted him last week, but... Um, the dust of death. Oh, it was Alistair Begg. Alistair Begg says there's this dust of death that just rests on everything during our days. And it's that dust that covers that no matter how good it is, you're still having to clean off the imperfection. The fact that things are degrading, spiraling down, not getting better. Is there progress? In certain ways, we have technological processes and progresses. But in the end, we've got enough food on earth, we can't feed everybody. We've got enough psychology on earth, we can't keep everybody at peace. There's 
progress in ways, but ultimately, it's a standstill. It's a standstill. I have seen everything that is done under the sun repeated there again, and behold, all is vanity, a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. Uh, you can identify the problem. You can look at it and you go, that's crooked. But it would be like if you're familiar with the old, we don't have too many of these anymore, but if you had the old wire clothes hangers, okay, it'd be a great tactile illustration is to take one of those, show it to you in its original form, and just twist it a little bit, and then pass it around and let you attempt to try to bring it back to its original state. You can't do it, not without some kind of machinery. And it's broken. It's crooked. We can identify it, but we can't fix it. It cannot be straightened. Politics can be studied, but you cannot make peace. You can study economics, but you cannot solve the issues between owners and workers. Uh, you know, it's just man is broken. There's an old illustration of a guy who's uh, sitting around, I think he's probably an American, trying to watch some football game, and his three-year-old son keeps coming up and interrupting, and he's trying to get him to just give him enough peace to watch this game. And so he sees a National Geographic, a magazine about the world, you know, sitting there, and he opens it up, and he finds this picture of the world, and it's got all these colors, and it's got all these difficult you know, images on it on this one page. And so he rips it out of the magazine. He tears it up into a hundred pieces and he gives it to his son. And he says, hey, go put that back together. Thinking that it's going to buy him some time. The son goes over to the coffee table and he comes back within just a minute. And it's all put back together. And the dad's amazed. And he goes, how did you do that? He goes, that's a very difficult structure there. He goes, well, Dad, on the other side, there's this simple picture of this man. And when I put the man together, the world came into place. And honestly, that's the answer. And that's the whole illustration goes to the whole meaning of the book of Ecclesiastes is that we as individuals need to be seeking not just life through these things, but first and foremost, as I'm giving away the whole sermon today, you can go home after the statement, but once you have God, then the man gets put together, and the world, as much as it can, can be put together until the end of time. I've shared this illustration before, but me and uh, a buddy of mine were down in Kanye Sumer, and we were sitting there and just meeting, talking about how life was going, doing some discipleship. And uh, this, and he wasn't rude at all. He just had not the greatest of English. Much better than my French, but not the greatest of English. And he came up to us while we were sitting there, because we were talking in English, because it was just two of us. And uh, he comes up and goes, you don't belong here. And he didn't mean you don't belong here. He meant, what are you doing here? You guys, obviously, your accents, your language, your look, you don't fit here. And so I just looked at him and I said, what do you mean I don't belong here? I've lived here, I think, at that time, 12 years. Again, he couldn't tell by my French. But um, I said, where, where are you from? And he goes, oh, well, I'm from Paris. I'm here on vacation. And I said, well, then you don't belong here. <laughs> and so he kind of laughed at me, and he sat down, and I started asking him questions. I said, so tell me your story. He had two master's degrees. He's, in, uh, he, he's uh, not a videographer, but someone who makes films. I forget the technical word for that. And, um, and so he's got these two master's degrees. I said, whoa, bro. So that puts you in the top 1% of educated people in the world. I said, how do you think, how do you think the world's doing? He goes, oh, no, no. It's bad, bad, bad. I was like, okay, I give you the reign of France. You take over France. How do you fix it? And he goes, education, education, education. I said, oh, okay, cool. I said, Greece tried that, Europe inherited that, America stole that, how do you think we're doing? Yeah, no, 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 government, government, government. I said, okay, well, Rome, Rome, Rome tried government. Uh, I mean, French perfected it. I mean, half of the U.S. Constitution, social system, and everything has been stolen from here. How do you think we're doing? He goes, no, 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 no. I was like, okay, so what's your answer? You're the educated one. 
And he said, what we need is what Africa has. And I was like, I have not heard this. <laughs> I'm like, okay, hit me. I said, I, I want to hear your response here. And he goes, what we need is what Africa has. We need somebody like a dictator to come in and tell us the way out. We need somebody because what the problem is that all dictators are corrupt and they fall and they and, and I was amazed. I about fell out of my seat. I said, bro, you've got the answer. He goes, I just told you it's not an answer. I said, no, no, no. We need someone from outside to come inside and tell us the way out of here. And his name is Jesus Christ. And you should have just seen his face. I mean, it was like, what world are you from? You know, you really don't belong here. And all of a sudden, he had to go get a drink. We never saw him again. But, but that's what's going on in Ecclesiastes. This guy who had access, the Elon Musk of his day, he had access to everything, very intelligent. And he's saying, I'm going to take you through these things, and I'm going to show you how by themselves they're going to end up flat. Okay? I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after the wind. You ever tried to give the wind a hug, to, to catch it in a bottle? For much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. And, and it's true, it's, the more you know, the, the more difficult sometimes it gets. Um, the internet... Uh, though it increases our knowledge of the world, man, how depressing. And I, I tell you guys all the time that if you're going to read the news on the internet, you need to read it on your knees because otherwise you're going to be going to, to psychologist in a number of years. Because you need to read it and say, yeah, that's bad, but let me pray through that. That when we just read it and take it in, take in all the bad news over and over and over and over and over again, then we're going to get to where he gets at the end of chapter 2 in despair, and I think even possibly ready to jump. Okay? And that's not where we're supposed to be. Kind of like C.S. Lewis said, maybe it, instead of looking at this world and saying it's so miserable, maybe we should say we're meant for another place. A couple of other wise guys. Um, this one is Francis Schaeffer. If you don't know him, you should read Francis Schaeffer. He, he looks a little peculiar. He always wears his knickers. He's dead now, but he always wears his knickers and walks around with a stick through the hills of Switzerland. But um, other than that, he, he looks like he could come right out of The Hobbit. Um, but other than that, he gave his life to getting into a European culture and trying to understand the mindset of a postmodern, post-Christian society. All right? And he says, All men have a deep longing for significance, a longing for meaning. No man, regardless of his theoretical system, is content to look at himself as a finally meaningless machine, which can and will be discarded totally and forever. That we can't handle that kind of news. We either check out or we, we spin and burn, or we do something that we fool ourselves as meaningful. We become a workaholic, and then when we retire, we die quickly because there's no meaning. The astrophysicist Stephen Hawking, uh, if you don't know this guy, you should probably read him, but you should read him with your Bible next to you, because he was, uh, he was very against Christianity. He's a brilliant guy. Um, there's some great um, debates out there between him and, um, oh gosh, another guy, okay? But we are just an advanced breed of monkeys on a minor planet of a very average star, but we can understand the universe. And what he doesn't realize here is he's showing his own problem. We're just nothing, but wait a second, we've got something special. And it's that something special that he denied, that, that I believe is that we are made in the image of God, that we have been given something different than the monkeys. 
we have been put on this planet that actually opens up and we can see outside. You know most of the planets in our solar system, if you were standing on them, you couldn't see beyond. Just here. That we have life. That we have intelligence. That we have rationale. That we have choice. And what we make of that understanding will make or break you, as we're going to see in the final verse today. That I applied my heart to know wisdom. So he's going to take on intellectualism, and he's going to come to uh, intellectualism by itself is wisdom increases sorrow. Uh, I don't want you to hear the Bible downplaying wisdom. I, I can take you to other books in the Bible okay, that will exalt the need for us to seek after knowledge. But that's always secondary to the primary of knowing God first. That everything starts coming together. I used to do ministry at the University of North Texas at the um, physics department. And it was hilarious. They actually had offices on opposite sides of the hallway, but there were about eight professors, all right? Four of them believed in God, four of them did not. And the four who did not were on this side of the hall, and the four that did were on this side of the hall, and they studied the same stuff and came up with very different ideologies. It used to just blow my mind, because... I never had a physics class, let alone understood half of what those guys did. But I did take some physiology classes. I remember going to conferences and, and um, the professors, even with that wisdom, going out and getting drunk at those conferences. I'm like, hey, we're teaching people how to take care of their, their body, their temple, and you're just destroying it. Or uh, I do a lot of hospital visitation as a pastor. It always amazes me is when you're walking in that there's this group of nurses and doctors standing 50 feet away smoking. And you're just like, yeah, hey, don't you get this? Hey, and you're going to go in there and help that person who's on a respirator for doing what you're doing. But Wisdom can increase sorrow. And so he goes from intellectualism, he's going to take on a second one. He said, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself, but behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? So after wisdom, he will seek meaning and pleasure. He goes from intellectualism to hedonism and you're going to see he's going to move on a bit to materialism. Um, and I heard one pastor say that this is the movement of a, no insult to you college students, of a college student. His freshman year, he comes in thinking, hey, I'm going to th seek intelli intelligence. By the second year, hey, I'm just going to live to party, hedonism. And by the time he sees graduation coming out, hey, I want things. I'm going to go on to materialism. And if you don't have some stop gaps, if you don't have some good purposes with that education, God's not, again, a spoil sport. He's not trying to take pleasure away from us, but he's trying to give it to us. But it comes packaged in him. Once we learn to find our satisfaction in God himself, then all of his other gifts become the best and truest pleasures. We know how to work with them. We know how to let them go. We know how to use them. I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my wisdom still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do, so the, the sons of Adam to do under heaven during the few days of their life. All right, so he's a hedonistic scientist. He's getting drunk and taking notes. I, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them, all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of the growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver, gold, treasure of kings and provinces, 
I got singers. So this, he, he had the vineyards, the wine. He got female male servants. He's got women. And now he's got songs. So he's got wine, women, and song going for him here. He, he's delving into it all. I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. And my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. So he's pursuing pleasure as far as it will take him. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? And what's he, what he's saying there in that sentence, for what can the man do who comes after the king? He's saying, after me, after all my abilities, after my potential to research the subject, who after me can actually do it as much justice? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. So there's no one who's going to come after him who's going to give us a better answer is what he's saying. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. So there is some substance, kind of like Paul says, that exercise is good, but it's limiting. It's not, you can exercise all the way to your death, but you're still going to die. You can run those miles, you can eat that wheat germ, you can, you know, do whatever, but eventually you're going to die. You may die healthier, but you're going down. You may die after a little bit longer than all your friends, yet I perceive what the same event happens to them all. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will also happen to me. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise... As of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance. And all he's saying is that at the end of the life, someone gets my stuff. My degrees that were hanging on the wall will be taken down. My pleasures will be forgotten. There may be some photographs, but they will fade and be thrown eventually. The things I have created may last for a while, but some generation down the road is going to tear it down and build something else back up. That life under the sun, not above the sun, not with any purpose from above. So I hated life because what is done under the sun, verse 17, was grievous to me, for all is vanity, a striving after the wind. So leading a moral life is good, but we all end in the same way, and under the sun it becomes meaningless. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all, for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. If one thinks that work will be the thing that gives them a sense of purpose in life, it's not. It will only be temporary. The 40, 60, 80 hours if you're an American at a desk. It's not going to result in anything more than passing on fruit to another. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair. I think he's got to the end of the rope. He's like, man, there's nothing here. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the not night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. Tolstoy put it this way, My question, that which at the age of 50 brought me to the verge of suicide, was the simplest of questions lying in the soul of every man. 
a question without an answer to which one cannot live. It was, what will come of what I am doing today or tomorrow? What will come of my whole life? Why should I live? Why wish for anything or do anything? Is there any meaning in life that the inevitable death awaiting for me does not destroy? <laughs> yeah, 50's way old, I know. <laughs> uh, I think Tolstoy had humor in that statement, Raphael. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. Martin Luther said that this is the critical moment in the book of Ecclesiastes. That this is the defining point that the author is trying to make in between all the other chapters. And you'll see it repeated and I'll lift it up as we go through it. But that there is nothing better for a person to eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? And you say, wow, this seems like he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. It's vanity, yet it can be good. One of my favorite, probably my second or third favorite book, the opening lines, you're going to know it. Um, you're going to know it well. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Seems like an oxymoron. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. The spring of hope. The winter of despair. We had everything before us, and we had nothing about us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on it being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. And really, that's, that's what the world has become in a lot of ways, is a comparison, keeping up with the Joneses, that my life is good if it's better than yours. Or whoever that person is that I set as my standard. Whether it's intellectualism, whether it's pleasure, whether it's possessions, whether it's finances, whether it's where I live, whether it's what I do, the power I possess, the position I hold, it's in comparison to somebody else. And that person's going to die, and I'll have to create a new visual, and I'm going to die. In fact, Dickens was told once, it can't be both. Which is it? But of course it can be both, and it often is. We live in a world that is cursed by sin, Genesis 3.17. But it is also a world that was created essentially good, Genesis 1 and 2. And it's this dichotomy in which we trespass temporarily in what we call life, and we go through it trying to find purpose and meaning so that we can come to understanding. But there is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? And it continues, for to the one who pleases him, okay, the one who is known by him, the one who is his, God has given wisdom, knowledge, and joy. A couple of guys brighter than me. There's many, but here's a couple. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ, Pascal. And Augustine said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And this is exactly what Ecclesiastes, the author, is saying. He's saying, until you have him first, everything else is vanity of vanity. Havel, meaningless, no purpose. I asked for all things to enjoy life. Instead, I was given life to enjoy all things. 
And that as we come to Christ and receive that life, things become from black and white to stale and gray to colored, vivid. And the pain has less of a sting, as Paul says about death. And we walk above the circumstances of the chaos, living in a reality that is and yet to come. Oh, I'm missing a slide. There we go. And this is how it ends in chapter 2. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, those who don't please him, those who have rebelled, those who reject, those who decide like Dawkins and Hawkins and others that he does not exist, to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. I think some of the most creative people on earth that have taken their own lives, I, I think a lot of it is they've come to this conclusion. They're, they're brilliant. The, the people are brilliant that are, are writing those songs, writing those books, creating those things. Um, and yet, like Robin Williams, who I, I think I could just watch him all day. His mind just thinks at 150 miles per hour. All right, 280 kilometers. I don't know what it is, Raphael. <laughs> but, yeah. And yet they come to this understanding that it's a bad business, it's evil that I'm spinning my wheels. But that's the downside of the story. The upside is 24, 25, and 26. For the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom. Wisdom, pleasure, materialism. Enjoy. Enjoy those things. You should have the biggest smiles. You should be the most generous. You should be happier than those without him because you have an understanding. You have made peace with what you know, what you get to feel, what you possess. And you don't clutch them as a purpose, as meaning of life. Uh, I'll speak to you believers because some of you know this to be true and let, yet you live as though it's not that you have been caught up in the mainstream circus of the world. And you look just like your neighbors. And you pursue things just like your neighbors. You know that they fall short and you deal with it occasionally, but you keep like a dog to its vomit coming back to it. And we shouldn't. It's a hearse that ends this part of our life. It's a coffin at death. It's not a U-Haul. You don't take stuff with you. No education, no politics, ultimately is going to prevail. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Romans 8. It's a familiar passage. You probably know it. But for those of us in Christ, it says in 8.28, actually, I want to start at 8.18. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, that today isn't as big as tomorrow. For the creation waits with eager longing. So even the creation, for the revealing of the sons of God. Okay, so here we have the sons of God, not the sons of Adam. Those who have come to understand. For the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, vanity of vanities, havel, but not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You can go outside and you can look at it, and even though it's fallen, you can tell that there is something designing that that is bigger than what it is. For 
For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. So from creation to the created, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We, we have this knowledge, we know, but we groan inwardly. Ah. As Igor prays for his home country, we groan. As we see people suffer through illness, hurt, pain, loss, we groan. As we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, that the sons of God, the children of God, have been lifted up from the sons of Adam, and they are going forth to somewhere better yet. And that's where our hope lies, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. It's not possessions. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Skip down a few verses, and this is the verse you'll know, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good for those who are called according to his purpose. Life under the sun, chavel. Vanity, meaningless, ultimately. Maybe a little fun here and there, but really it's just a temporary pass-through. But when the sun has been poked past and the eternal comes through in the form of Jesus Christ and he walks and shows us what life is supposed to be like and then he dies and takes away the death dust of the world so that we too can be reclaimed, redeemed, and return to him in a way that we will have fellowship and relationship. Though fallen here, yet one day not. We groan here, but one day we will glorify fully. Christian, don't get caught up too much in the things of this world. Enjoy them, yes. Do not be a grievous, downtrodden. I, I'm a grave person. I know it. My wife, she's always smiley, and I think I offset her. I'm always kind of just here. But there's a joy that comes from both of us that is not of any possession that we have found. It is in a person named Jesus Christ. And if you're trying to live life as a Christian without acknowledging him in your life, it's meaningless. If you're trying to live life without him altogether, it's going to end poorly. Come. Today is the acceptable day of your salvation. Today is the acceptable day for your return. If you, like all of us, at one point or another, being prodigal, walk away, return. Because life without him is going to end in a failure. Life with him will be in its fullness.